right. I'll call to, all, excuse me, call to order the study session of the Newport Beach City Council for October 25th, 2016. Madam Clerk. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Uh, we'll go right into current business. A clarification of items on the consent calendar. Do we have any comments from members of the council? No? All right, we'll go to item number two, the local coastal program implementation plan. If community development director, Ms. Brand and Mr. Alford would like to speak to that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, Mayor Dixon and members of the City Council. Uh, as the slide suggests, it's been a long road for the City of Newport Beach. Uh, since the Coastal Act was adopted in 1972, uh, we've been working on this for a number of years. The City had its first land use plan uh, certified in the late 1980s, and then we did a major update uh, that was certified by the Coastal Commission in 2005. And then after a hiatus, well, the city updated its general plan and the zoning code, we resumed that process and uh, brings us here tonight. Uh, just to show you that the implementation plan or IP is gonna be one of the major documents in the city's uh, regulatory scheme along with the zoning code and the Newport Coast LCP. The implementation plan would add a new title 21 to the city code. It's based on the city's zoning code, it includes all the land uses and property development regulations, but it has a number of uh, chapters and sections that deal specifically with the requirements of the Coastal Act, including public access, resource protection, and administration, primarily dealing with the issuance of coastal development permits, which the city is basically after to you know, receive through the certification of the LCP. Um, we really started in earnest in 2013, um, beginning with the general plan LCP certification committee. They held nine meetings between 2013 and 2015, uh, probably <laughs> 19. Um, and as we had a, a document ready, we held a, a series of community meetings. Uh, some deal with ge geographic areas, some deal with issues. There were uh, four study sessions, the Planning Commission and Harbor Commission and City Council. And uh, we did extensive notice. We provided a notice availability as soon as the draft was available. We did press release, uh, our uh, news alerts. Uh, we uh, mailed a flyer to all coastal zone property owners, uh, provided an informational brochure, and of course had draft copies of the implementation plan at City Hall, public libraries, and on the city's website. Now, the first action on our uh, program since the council approved it about a year ago was a set of coastal zone boundary adjustments. This involved 10 areas, and within the limited parameters that is provided for the Coastal Act to adjust the coastal zone boundary, we were successful on most of them. So 175 properties were taken out of the coastal zone. That uh, includes about uh, 282 dwelling units. So that was approved by the Coastal Commission back in April. Uh, then in, on September 8th of uh, this year, the Coast Commission actually approved the um, draft implementation plan, and uh, there were extensive modifications. Uh, matter of fact, 146 of the 191 implementation plan sections uh, were modified. Now, I know that seems like a lot, but a lot of them are fairly minor. They, they reflect changes in terms and uh, phrases that are uh, more inclined with what the Coast Commission is used to. It really follows the language of the Coastal Act. Uh, a number of cross-references and references to sections of the Coastal Act. So a lot of those just kind of reflect things to clarify or to provide additional information. But there are some major modifications and uh, they, they involve our bluff overlay. Uh, regulation of bulkheads, the beach hours, the city's shoreline height limitation zone, uh, lower cost visitor accommodations, water quality, and sea level rise. The bluff overlay is probably the most extensive changes that we received. It will involve more restrictions on bluffs subject to marine erosion. In other words, subject to some type of tidal action either from the ocean or uh, tidal action in estuaries such, such as the upper Newport Bay. Uh, these would be the um, Ocean Boulevard lots in uh, Corona del Mar, uh, the bluff lots in Shorecliffs and Cameo Shores, 
and most of the lots along Galaxy Drive and Dover Shores. Uh, Dover Shores currently does not have a bluff overlay. They are basically regulated by standard setbacks, but uh, the suggested modifications would add this bluff overlay to Dover Shores. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, there were some minor changes to the bluff areas on Avocado and Pacific Drive. Uh, just namely, the, uh, the major point was uh, pro prohibiting private uh, stairways and trails in uh, development area C, which I'll go into a little bit in a moment. And uh, there were no changes to the bluff overlay in Irvine Terrace. So just to familiarize yourself with the uh, bluff overlay that we have in the zoning code today, it, it creates three development zones. Development area A co covers principal structures or homes. Uh, area B covers uh, most accessory structures, including patios, pools, spas, barbecues, et cetera. And uh, area C is an area for limited uh, accessory structures, such as landscaping, irrigation system, fences, utilities, et cetera. Now, as modified by the Coastal Commission, uh, development area A would have provision for a 25-foot bluff edge setback for lots subject to marine erosion. Uh, area B would be, would be limited to surfacial grading and have a 10-foot bluff edge setback uh, for accessory structures on lots subject to marine erosion. And the 25-foot bluff setback would apply to what they determine as major accessory structures such as swimming pools and guest houses. And then finally, Area C, um, as it indicated that on bluff subject to marine erosion that uh, there'd be no private trails or stairways, uh, no property line fences or walls, irrigation systems would have to be temporary only, and there'd be limits on drainage devices and utilities. Namely, they could only occur there unless there was a, a more uh, a way to provide them in the other two development zones. Now, the Dover Shores Bluff overlay, as I indicated earlier, would involve uh, most of the properties along Galaxy Drive and uh, the, the terminus of Mariner's Drive and uh, parts of Santiago and Polaris. These are divided into two categories, ones that are subject to marine erosion, basically that have a, uh, a base of the bluff toe that actually is in an area that is subject to some type of tidal action. And then the other areas would be offset from that and they would be uh, not subject to marine erosion, so they're set back far enough where they're not influenced by that. So to give you an example of how the bluff overlay would be applied if, if the implementation plan is adopted, uh, this shows uh, a, a section of Galaxy Drive and uh, you would have the three development zones. You might recall we had the the uh, green area for the principal structures and a yellow area for accessory structures and then the red area for um, the minor accessory structures. So most of the lots would be fall into area A uh, because in that section of the town, uh, the rear edge setbacks are either 20 or 25 feet from the property line. But now we'd have an additional restriction of a setback from the bluff edge, and that varies in some areas. In some cases, it's right on the property line. In other cases, it's beyond the property line. In some cases, it goes a little bit inland from the property line. So we're going to go with a more restrictive of the two. So either the 20 or 25 foot bluff, pardon me, 25, 25 rear guard setback would apply, or the 25 feet from the bluff edge. And there are a few instances where. Um, uh, the, um, the uh, property goes beyond the bluff edge and that would become an area C with, which is the very limited uh, accessory structures. Now, the lot subject to marine erosion, this shows a Polaris. This is uh, based on a different set of standards. Rather than being from the bluff edge, it's set on the predominant line of development, which generally follows the setbacks that were established a number of years ago. So you, again, the, it's, you, the large area for the principal structures and then you have a, the yellow area for accessory structures, and in some cases you'll have a small area that will be for the limited accessory structures. Uh, upper, at the other end of uh, Dover Shores on Santiago in the very edge of uh, Galaxy Drive, um, the setbacks are only six feet and the uh, development zones are adjusted accordingly. 
Yes. Patrick, could mm -hmm. you go back to one of those? So are you, mm -hmm. let's just use one of the, the mm -hmm. uh, rectangle lot. Are you suggesting then that the, the buildable area is the green or the, the pr primary structure area is the green rectangle and then the a home could be built on that to the north of the, the green area with a 25 foot setback from that green, the, the green line? Not in this example, because this is an area subject, not subject to being erosion. <clears throat> so it basically follows the predominant line of development and that was established by the setbacks that are already in place. So we have development zone A in green, which would be the principal structures and accessory structures. And then the six foot setback from the property line would make area B, which would be accessory structures. And then if there's any area that is not in A or B that's still within the property line, that would go into area C. If, if I purchased 2124 with the notion that I was gonna fill that lot with the exception of, of standard zoning setbacks, could I do that under the current IP? Yes, because this, uh, this basically the permanent line development is established by the existing okay. setbacks. Is that also true? I, I'm, I'm trying to find the distinction mm -hmm. between that and this, the, the erosion bluff edge. Is that also the case? Okay. I could fill the green area subject to the standard zoning setbacks. Well, let's take an example of, of a lot subject to mean erosion. So it, it'll vary from lot to lot, but uh, uh, because these areas have either a 20 or 25 foot setback from the property line, so this is the property line, it's set back either 20 or 25 feet, depends on what stretch of uh, Galaxy Drive we're talking about. Um, that, those would be the setbacks that you have to abide by today. However, the um, the Coastal Commission would require an additional setback. It would be from the bluff edge, and I don't know if you can see it here, but it's this kind of orange line. That is our estimate of where the bluff edge is, and it's set back uh, 25 feet for the principal structure from that line. Uh, Wait, I, I didn't understand what that. Mm -hmm. What did you just say? Okay, so 25 feet from the principal structure from the line. The, the, the development zone A, the area in green, would be set back a minimum of 25 feet from the bluff edge. So um, in a, you're gonna go with either the more restrictive of the two, either the, the setback that's either 20 or 20, uh, uh, pardon me, 20 or 25 feet from the property line or 25 feet from the bluff edge, which is the line in yellow. So this is the more restrictive of the two. Now, I know this is uh, a, a change and will constrain some properties more uh, than our current zoning regulations. However, the Coastal Commission has established a 25 foot bluff edge setback uh, for areas that they consider the safest in terms of geologic stability. And for a number of years, the Coastal Commission has been enforcing this bluff edge setback on properties in this area. So it is, while it's been not required by the city, it has been the practice by the Coastal Commission to have this bluff edge set back for a number of years, and they have approved coastal development permits uh, to that setback requirement. So simply said, by virtue of this change, we're aligning our, our setbacks, our zoning, to what the practice has been at the Coastal Commission. The owner of these properties are they giving up anything by virtue of this IP? If I, I, I want to make sure that, right. that our residents are not, are not feeling right. the pinch. And this is something that we really discussed a lot at the staff level was is that what were to happen if the city were not to adopt the implementation plan with these additional modifications to this area. And so the consequence of that would be is that, this, that the permit authority would not transfer to the city of Newport Beach and it would be retained with the Coastal Commission. And these same standards that we're referring to today would be applied by coastal staff and by the Coastal Commission. So so, so the reality is, is, is that they will still need to apply, uh, uh, 
comply with these development standards, but they have to go through Long Beach in order to get a coastal development permit. Were there any questions or comments regarding the bluff overlay? If not, I'll go on to the boatman section. Well, I just would uh, make an additional comment at the coastal. You might want to comment on the um, proceedings of the coastal commission on this issue because staff tried nobly tried to uh, dis uh, dissuade the coastal commission from imposing these tighter restrictions, and we won some. We won most, uh, and mm -hmm. this was one that uh, they neglected to agree with staff on. But you fought a noble battle for the residents in this area. <laughs> yeah, we did, and I think, as Patrick mentioned, that we were able to identify some of the lots, and I want to say it's probably about at one quarter of the lots along that bluff edge that are not subject to marine erosion and they have a less stringent setback requirement. And also we have to remember that the, this is an estimate of the bluff edge that we're showing is based on a 2014 uh, ge geological study that we have. So when people come in and they want to redevelop their property, they'll have to do a stability and bluff assessment at that point and determine where the bluff edge is. But again, but that's for the principal structure and for swimming pools, accessory structures may be able to be located closer to the bluff edge. They only need to be set back 10 feet. So this is the reality of what we're dealing with um, in the coastal zone. So the next big major issue is dealing with shoreline protective devices, or more commonly, the bulkheads that appear in the harbor. Um, the um, Coastal Act has rather uh, stringent restrictions on the use of protective devices, and they're intended to uh, protect a limited range of uses uh, there uh, under the Coastal Act as, as well as existing development. Um, Coast Commission um, over the years has become more and more stringent on interpretation of this, and they've been through conditions uh, requiring expiration dates for shoreline protective devices and uh, with geared towards their eventual removal. Uh, they've even required the waiver of uh, property rights to protect and uh, to repair and maintain uh, protective devices as conditions in coastal development permits. Uh, our major concern, of course, is that um, we have a system of harbor bulkheads that uh, protect more than just the property right adjacent to it. It's part of a system that protects the, uh, the entire area and makes the harbor possible. And so uh, we had uh, so, uh, a number of concerns that were addressed to the Coast Commission. We worked out a number with staff, and then finally we had, uh, uh, I think we prevailed uh, with the Coast Commission itself, and they provided a uh, explicit exemption for development along Newport Bay. It also recognizes that there is a need for an essential, uh, essential need for a system of harbor bulkheads in order for, to protect uh, the harbor and the surrounding development. Uh, so we had that language inserted into the draft modifications by the Coastal Commission itself, and uh, we feel that uh, this, uh, uh, these modifications that were made at the hearing uh, address the city's major concerns concerning uh, these bulkheads. So are we aware of any other city or uh, IP that they've done this? Because they're pretty st strict on these shoreline protected devices. I'm not aware of any. There are a number of updates uh, going on currently, and it's possible they might be in those documents. But generally, they've implemented this at the uh, project level through coastal development permits. So what happens to the properties that have already got coastal development permits that that gave up the rights to rebuild their bulk, bulkheads. Are they going to, do they get to fall under this provision or are they stuck with what they accepted at the Coastal Commission already? I, I'm not aware of that condition being imposed on any projects in the city, but um, the Coastal Commission does basically retain authority over our permits they have issued. Now, it's a little unclear at what mm. point was an a, uh, existing permit approved by the Coastal Commission becomes a new project that the city can approve. That's something I don't have a clear answer to at the moment, but it's something I think that we're definitely going to have to address as we go throughout the implementation plan. 
Although I could just add as a postscript, the Coastal Commission will retain authority over the, the bulkheads, but since we now have explicit language in the IP, it'll serve as a guidance document to coastal staff in terms of how the bulkheads are to be treated. And if there is an existing coastal development permit in regards to the bulkhead, I would believe that it could be amended to be consistent with the new IP regulations so that it could be repaired and maintained or replaced in, pl in, in the current location. There, there are specific provisions that it cannot extend seaward as part of that process. It can only extend landward. So the next big issue was the beach hours or the beach curfew. Um, the draft implementation plan that uh, was approved by the council only can uh, basically had a reference that the city has historically regulated the uh, hours of, of beaches uh, or the uses of beaches at night. Uh, and it was left at that. Um, we had an extensive discussion with Coast Commission staff, and in the end, uh, the, it seemed like the best approach is to maintain our current um, uh, beach hours is to actually have them in the implementation plan. So the um, beach hours of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. will be in the uh, implementation plan. Uh, consequently, if we were to change those hours, um, it would require an LCP amendment. Uh, another provision is that we have to recognize the public's constitutional right to access the wet sand and the water. And, um, but we do have provisions in, the, um, in that section of the IP that allows for um, closure of beaches in emergency situations and to abate public nuisances. Uh, shoreline height limitation zone. Um, the draft implementation plan basically had it per the zoning code, which was a 26 uh, height limit for uh, flat roof structures and 31 feet for sloped roof structures with a 35 foot max that could be achieved through a coastal development permit. And we had our standard zoning code exceptions for architectural features, dorm dormers, chimneys, uh, uh, stairwells, and so forth. Um, and we also had the specific exemptions that were uh, approved for Marina Park Lighthouse and Lido House. Uh, unfortunately, the Coastal Commission established this as a 35-foot maximum without any exceptions. And uh, you would require an LCP amendment for any project that would exceed that 35-foot height limit. They did include the uh, Marina House, uh, pardon me, the Marina Park Lighthouse exemption in Lido House, and uh, I don't have it here, but also the exception for boat cranes. So this is one that um, we chose not to fight further uh, because we had to limit our uh, number of issues that we had to present to the Coast Commission itself, but we hope that we can return uh, shortly after certification with an LCP amendment to reinstate um, the uh, exemptions that are provided for under the zoning code. Uh, lower cost visitor accommodations, as you may know through the Lido House project, this has been a emerging issue with the Coast Commission and uh, we wanted to address it by basically only requiring an impact analysis on a um, coastal development permit that involved the demolition, conversion, or closure of an existing lower cost visitor accommodation. The Coastal Commission modifications, uh, which expand that to include um, an impact analysis for any CDP involving visitor accommodation, including not just the demolition or closure, but also the expansion, the reduction, redevelopment, and for any new project involving visitor accommodations of any type. And it would require a feasibility study to determine if uh, lower cost visitor accommodations could be provided within the project itself. Uh, water quality, uh, the implementation plan basically had uh, the basic components of the uh, existing city code requirements regarding water quality. Um, we had an extensive critique of these regulations by their uh, water quality specialist. And in the end, it was determined that there was significant enough difference between their model water quality guidance document and our regulations that we couldn't actually adapt ours to fit theirs and vice versa. So 
the modifications would delete the section that we had on water quality and replace it with the uh, basically a, uh, a chapter that's based on their water quality guidance. Now we had this reviewed by our water, water quality staff and they determined that uh, while the language is somewhat different, it basically ends up in the same place. It, 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 it does the same requirements for uh, stormwater runoff control and water quality management. Um, it just, the terminology is differently. And then we have uh, the issue of sea level rise. This too has been an emerging issue with the Coast Commission. Um, uh, it was an unfortunate case of timing because just as we had completed our draft document, the uh, Coast Commission adopted a sea level rise guidance document. And the comments from the Coast Commission staff is that we should incorporate as much of that into the implementation plan as possible. Uh, we pointed out that it would be unfair for us to basically stop everything that we have done to this date, do all the data collection, the technical analysis, and all the policy adjustment that the guidance document calls for. Uh, it, would, it would take years, and we'd have to basically place the entire effort on hold while that's conducted. So as a compromise, we had this new Appendix A in the implementation plan that uh, basically follows the guidance document, recognizes what the city has done and will continue to do, and uh, sets procedures for the review of CDPs in shoreline areas, low-line areas, and on eroding coastal bluffs. One key to this, though, it does call for a future LCP update, although no time frame is specified, uh, based on a future vulnerability assessment. Uh, so basically, we were gonna have to, we'd, we'd be committed to conducting a, uh, a study of uh, the city's vulnerability to sea level rise. Uh, now, I'd like to point out that um, this is um, already required for the city's public trust lens that, that we're the trustee of uh, through Assembly Bill uh, 691, which I think is uh, July of 2019, requires that we conduct this study for the tidelands. So it's possible that we might be able to expand that to include non-public trust lands and meet this requirement. Um, modifications included deleting a number of uh, sections of the IP, either partially or entirely. Uh, one was an exemption we had for wetland restoration projects. Basically, it would allow the filling on a very limited basis, some areas as part of restoration project. Um, this was something that had appeared in older LCPs, but over the years, the Coast Commission has more or less moved away from this, and uh, so they asked that we take that out. We also had a section dealing with limited duration uses and structures. This would be th things like temporary construction yards to um, uh, pumpkin sales and Christmas tree lots, the ones that we have generally approve administratively. But uh, I think the Coastal Commission staff was correct to point out that uh, we can exempt these things from coastal development permit requirements. Only the exemptions allowed under the Coastal Act uh, can be um, used in these cases. So we took that section out. Likewise, special events, it was generally taken out because uh, the ones dealing with these special events uh, that uh, in, in coastal areas are covered by the exemptions in the administration chapter, so it was really redundant. Uh, one we didn't quite agree with, but it really wasn't a major deal, was taking out the entire chapter dealing with the amendment of the LCP, where we had the basic procedures uh, for, for amending the document. We felt this is something we need to administer, but they thought it was inappropriate to put it into an implementation plan, so that, again, was a battle we didn't think we needed to fight. Um, the permit and appeal jurisdiction maps, you might recall from a year ago that we had a draft set of maps uh, that we were gonna submit and have them approve that showed the uh, areas where the Coast Commission retains permit jurisdiction and what areas they have ap appeal authority. However, um, after our submittal, they made it clear that uh, the only map they'll accept is one that comes from their mapping unit, and that has to be done after the certification occurs. So we won't see those maps until um, the LCP is certified, so we had to take uh, basically those maps out, any references to them. Um, the eelgrass mitigation plan we included as an appendix in the document. Um, they deleted it. Um, 
without any explanation. We only put it in there because we did have policies in the CLUP relating to eelgrass and we wanted to implement through that uh, approved program. But if they don't feel it's necessary to have it actually in the IP, then I don't think we're gonna argue with that. Um, the Balboa Village Parking Management Overlay, we included that in the IP. Um, however, Coastal Commission staff felt that they didn't have sufficient information or time to do an analysis of that, and therefore they wanted it taken out. And that's another thing that we hope to return to the Coast Commission through an LCP minute after the LCP is certified. And then finally, we had a section uh, dealing with preferential parking districts. This is basically the council's ability to establish resident parking permits in areas. Uh, our coastal land use plan has a policy addressing this. It basically says it can be done through the CDP process. But, and we had that in the implementation plan, but again, the Coastal Commission did not feel that was appropriate for the implementation plan, so they deleted it. I think, again, we can go back and address this issue and, and get the uh, ability to do this through the CDP process as is provided in our certified coastal land use plan. Uh, we have a number of new sections added as well. Um, the um, CVLV zoning district that was done for the Lido House Hotel, that was approved after we submitted it, so we included it into the document. The Back Bay Landing Plan Community text uh, actually came effective after we had submitted the document, so that was placed in. Uh, our, the city's telecommunication ordinance was translated and put into it. Uh, the implementation plan is a new chapter to address some comments we received from the Coast Commission. They also asked us to put in our off-site parking space specifications. These things would deal with aisle width and, and uh, uh, space dimensions and so forth, so that was added. It just, re again, reflects what we have in the zoning code currently. Um, basically, our procedures and operational requirements for short-term lodging permits was added. That's from a different section of the municipal code, but it'll be in, in the implementation plan. And then finally, the ocean fund encroachment policy was added as an appendix. So, um, what happens next? Um, on November 4th, the uh, Coastal Commission will consider the city's application for the continuation of the categorical exclusion order that exempts most uh, two and uh, single family houses from coastal development permits requirements. This applies to the R1, the R1 Baba Island, and the R2 zoning districts. Uh, it has the same terms as the categorical exclusion order was approved in 1977, that would include a 1.5 FAR limit requirement for two parking spaces, excludes the first row of lots on the shoreline, but we have uh, included the canyon properties. It'd have to be subject to the LCP regulations, but they would fall under that category exclusion order as proposed. Um, the only other thing is that we updated the zoning map because there was a number of properties, mainly parks, that were zoned R1 in 1977 that are now in a different zoning district, so they would be subject to the category exclusion order either by the zoning or by the type of development that occur. Uh, Coastal Commission staff, as uh, report is out, and they are recommending approval. We have reviewed it, and uh, we feel that it is supportable, and so hopefully on November 4th, we'll have that guarantee that we've been looking for that the category exclusion order will continue post LCP certification. So, the next steps, as I indicated, the category exclusion continuation hearing is on November 4th. We have the City Council hearing on the implementation plan itself on uh, November 7th, second reading on November 22nd. Then we submit the document to the Coastal Commission Executive Director for determination basically that the Council's action reflects the action of the uh, Coastal Commission. Uh, once that determination is made, the uh, Executive Director places it on the next available um, Coastal Commission agenda and if they concur, we get a notice of certification and that is filed with the state and uh, then we're effectively certified. After that, we wait for the post-certification map from the mapping unit. So this sli slide wasn't my idea. <laughs> but we feel like there is reason to, uh, to celebrate because this has been a very long and difficult process going over a number of years and a number of city councils. And um, 
but we're very close, very, I think we're very close. Thank you, Mr. Selish. So under the current process, when you get a coastal development permit, you're required to record a deed restriction as part of that permit. Now that the city is gonna be issuing the permit, is that same procedure still gonna be in effect where we're gonna require people to record those deed restrictions? Uh, it may be through the conditions of approval. I guess it would depend on the coastal development permit and uh, what issues are associated with that. Um, well, we right, might now, have right now, all the projects I've done in the coastal zone, it doesn't seem to reflect any um, particular criteria based on the project. As far as I'm aware of, every CDP they issue, they require a deed restriction to be recorded. That's correct. We can double check, but I don't believe that provision was included in the draft IEP because that's, that's not a city procedure. Excellent. Any other questions up here? I'll turn it to the public. Any comments from the members of the public? Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, my main comment about this has been a very difficult process for the public to follow. Uh, since last November, there has been in each of the city libraries a copy of the 500 or so pages of the city's draft proposal for the implementation plan. It seemed rather pointless to look at that, though, because the public knew that the city staff and the Coastal Commission staff were privately negotiating changes to that, and we've seen that there were indeed massive changes to the document the public had to review, but the amended compromise proposal was not made available to the public in a, until a few days before the September Coastal Commission meeting held in this room. And on the night before the Coastal Commission meeting, still more changes came out. And on the day of the hearing, still more changes came out at noon with the hearing a few hours later. That makes it difficult for the public to follow. And when the public attempted to comment on specific issues about the Coastal implementation plan that was before the Coastal Commission in September, they were told by the Commission Chair, Mr. Kinsey, the more appropriate forum and the more relaxed one to do that at would be here, but I can't see how that can work because as I understand it, you have to either take or leave the entire compromise package that was approved back in September. I could add that Commissioner Kinsey also thought and congratulated the public and the staff of the two agencies that with the adoption of the implementation plan, the Coastal Commission would be relieved of having to issue permits for docks in Newport Harbor, which is a big thing that they do now, and I think that's completely incorrect. I think that the Coastal Commission will continue to do that. Having said that, and this being the forum that he recommended, one of the things that Oh, oh, another thing that bothers me is between then and now, uh, there has been a report every two weeks to the Planning Commission about what's going on with respect to this. And the Planning Commission has been told by the city staff that they have been negotiating and working through the suggested modifications that were adopted in September. And I cannot understand what that negotiation or modification could be and I would be curious to know if the report, which apparently was posted last Thursday on the city's website, there is now a complete package of what is being proposed to be adopted, if that is the same as was adopted back in September, or that's still a further modification that I have to read through to see what has been changed. My main concern is about the height provisions because our coastal land use plan promises that we will maintain the height restrictions we had in effect in October of 2005. And yet, the draft that I have seen and the draft that was posted last Thursday has changes that were made since then, and I don't think it's consistent with our land use plan. My time is up, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from member of the public? members of the public? Please come forward. Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Any other, any questions from council members? Seeing none. Um, Ms. Brandt and Mr. Alford, I want to first of all thank you for your many years of work. And Mr. Selich, how many years ago did you start working on this? 
<laughs> it's been a life work, a, a life journey. Um, partially to address uh, Mr. Mosier's comments, do you want to speak to the steps going forward as coming before uh, the November 7th City Council meeting? Uh, and just comment, how, I know you have held the, uh, a number of community meetings as you cited in the first part of your report. How will we be communicating with members of the public? I mean, it will be posted and, and the normal posting. Do we need to do anything extra in terms of the kind of changes that have happened since September 8th? Do you want to comment on that? Well, first of all, I understand that the negotiation with the coastal staff went up to 11th hour, literally, with the, uh, just before the, uh, the hearing started. Uh, so uh, it, we make the information available as soon as we received it. We had staff report posted, Mr. Mosier indicated, and we just recently received the uh, final, final uh, suggested modification from Coastal Commission staff, which has been posted on the website as well. Um, as far as the um, public hearing, uh, well, the starting with this study session is to get the information out. Uh, we are also going to publish a uh, eighth page newspaper advertisement in the paper notifying of the public hearing. And um, we have been meeting one-on-one uh, -on -one with the groups that are most affected okay. by this, uh, namely the bluff owners. And uh, we have been going over the changes and, and trying to address any concerns that they might have. Well, that's very good. I'm pleased to, pleased to hear that. Well, I want to commend you and staff and Mr. Selwich for your life work on this and any other former council members who have spent um, many hours getting to this point. This is historic as we move forward to the final action. Seeing uh, no other comments, what we're just receiving and filed today, we're directing staff to come back with the resolution at the next council meeting, is that correct? Just, just to reaffirm that, Madam Mayor and council members, so on Monday, November 7th, that's our special meeting that involves a number of things, potentially including auto nation. Um, this item will come back to you for first reading. So if you have concerns about it, um, please let the staff know individually. Otherwise, we're gonna ask for an affirmative vote on November 7th to move that forward to second reading on the 22nd. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, staff. Very good. Madam Mayor, that, that assumes the Coastal Commission approves our categorically exempt area on the 4th, correct? That would be correct. Thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk. Public comments. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are invited on items listed on the agenda and non-agenda items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The city council has discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. Any members of the public wishing to speak, please come forward. Identify yourself. Uh, my name is... Uh... Go ahead. My name is Charles Griffin. I'm a resident here for some 65 years, property owner. And I wish to... Um, I've tried to be active, but... Uh, and initiated the California Environmental Quality Act and helped write the uh, required documents for the city while I was here. But what I wanted today is bring to you a new, make you aware of a new source of energy. I, uh, I'm a professional, retired professional engineer, developed uh, nuclear weapons uh, for the Air Force and for the Navy, nuclear bombs and um, Developed uh, systems, uh, 21 stealth bombers to deliver them and attack bombers to deliver them anywhere in the world from aircraft carriers with Donald Douglas, 35 years. But what I want to tell you today is a new source of energy that's being developed, which you should be aware of, utilizing boron, because we need to, it means that it will be a new complete change in all our public utilities for the source of electrical power, water, and gas and uh, electric, electrical power, water, and gas, our utilities. Completely a new, new change, which you all need to be aware of. 
That source of energy is from the fusion of hydrogen and boron being developed over the last 30 years or 40 years. I worked with uh, Professor Norman Rostocker at the University of uh, California at Irvine to develop a, a reactor, which Paul Allen of Microsoft is building a reactor up in Lake Forest to, um, to fuse hydrogen and boron. Uh, and uh, you should be aware of that and even visit that facility. Tri-Alpha Energy is the name of the company. You can get it on the website, Tri-Alpha Energy. And uh, it's a, it's a uh, method of using uh, a couple of uh, coils to uh, bring hydrogen and boron together. But that uh, is something for you to look at. And I'll continue these discussions later uh, at additional meetings. But primarily the main system that's uh, under, that's yeah, being come to uh, fruition is from a company in New Jersey. They've been working on it for, since, uh, for about 30 years under, Paul, under Bob Gates, who was Secretary of Defense when he was Chancellor of Texas A&M. Those university students there uh, proposed a, a rocket to uh, take the Voyager to Mars and back out to uh, for the for the yeah, that rocket go to Jupiter and go and take pictures of all the Saturn but that but they have developed a reactor in uh, New Jersey now and uh, it's based on a uh, using a spark plug emulating what uh, occurs in actual uh, thunderstorms <laughs> Go to focusfusion.org, focusfusion.org. I'll talk to you later. Mr. Griffin, thank you uh, for speaking. I don't know, if, can you hear me? Of course. Um, yes. What was it specifically that you would like the city of Newport Beach to do? Each of individually go to focusfusion.org and learn about this new source of energy to produce electrical power, which we can put in the ocean create hydrogen gas to put it in the gas system in our house. When I, my house on Balboa Island was used hydrogen when I, was, when I bought the house to heat our homes. We was later placed with methane from pipeline from New Mexico. But uh, we now need to use hydrogen from the ocean, and hydrogen from the ocean to, get, uh, to put into our homes, pipe up to the top of the mountains and to the top of our buildings where we put fuel cells to convert that hydrogen into water, which we can then is clean water. We don't have to pipe the water from, the, from, from Mammoth Mountain and from the Colorado River and from Northern California. We can produce water right in our own city. The, the reactor, uh, the hydrogen boron reactor is the size of a, uh, a handicapped bathroom, toilet bathroom and a public bathroom. We're going to show all the power for the unit, for the city of Newport Beach. Okay, well, we'll uh, thank you for sharing this and educating us, and we will look into it and look forward to hearing from you Focus, again. Focusfusion.org. Focusfusion.org. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you for your attention. Sure. Any other comments from the public? Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name, as you well know, is Jim Mosier. Closed... Sessions typically involve private discussions about litigation that the city is or may be involved in, frequently with very cryptic descriptions to the public of the subject matter. I was therefore startled in a pleasant way to see that item B on the present agenda describes in some detail a lawsuit that the city might face over flood damage pursuant to a claim that we are all able to review in the city clerk's office. It would have been even more refreshing if the agenda had provided a similar brief description of what the three existing lawsuits under item A are about, or the three possible new matters of litigation under item C, I can tell you that I, for one, have no idea. Speaking of legal issues, I would like to expand on my comment at your last evening meeting about the city's measure MM on the November ballot. That measure would amend our city charter to prevent placing tax increases on the ballot without approval by at least five of seven council votes. From the very brief discussion the council had about this last year, I understood the language was borrowed from the city of Anaheim. And Anaheim does indeed have a very similar measure U on the November 8th ballot. 
However, for reasons unknown to me, this city has changed the Anaheim language from requiring the approval to be, quote, at least a two-thirds vote of the total members of the city council to requiring at least five of seven votes. This reminds me of Measure EE in 2012, when after concocting 37 charter changes of our own, we added a 38th about red light traffic cameras, again borrowed from the city of Anaheim, and when it was pointed out that in copying it, we left out the last part of a very large sentence, leaving it both ungrammatical and nonsensical, it was claimed that that change was an improvement over the original, and that flawed language is now part of our charter. At least to me, requiring five of seven votes clearly means something different than requiring an affirmative vote by two-thirds of the membership which in Newport Beach would simply require five yes votes, irrespective of how many council people happen to be present. Measure MM says seven council members have to be present and vote, and at least five of the seven votes have to be yes. This may or may not be better than the Anaheim process, but since I don't like laws that clearly say one thing, but about which our city attorney can say they mean something different, I, and I especially don't like putting poorly written language in our city charter. I just may join Mr. Bob McCaffrey in voting no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney, do you want to comment just so we're all clear? There's no confusion on what this ballot measure will do. Yeah, just briefly, what it does is it requires five or seven votes of the city council before any tax measure can be put on the ballot. This kind of, this basically, uh, arguably closes a loophole that was created in regards to Proposition 62. Um, and you do not have to have all the council members present uh, in order to move forward with that. You just need five of the seven votes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to speak, please come forward. Seeing none, Mr. City Attorney. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, the City Council will adjourn to closed session to meet with legal counsel regarding items 4A through C, including meeting with uh, council regarding the matter entitled Healthy Solutions Chiropractic versus City of Newport Beach, Merrick Miglior versus City of Newport Beach, and Andrew J. Martin versus City of Newport Beach, as well as the claim filed by CDO, Invest CDO Investments for alleged flood damage at 325 Old Newport Boulevard, and finally uh, to meet with legal counsel regarding the possible initiation of three matters. Thank you. Thank you. We are in recess till until 7 p.m. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular session of the Newport Beach City Council, October 25th, 2016. Madam Clerk? The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Mr. City Attorney? Uh, yes, we do have one reportable action uh, this evening in regards to initiation of litigation. The City Council directed the City Attorney to initiate litigation against the Federal Aviation Administration related to the Southern California Metroplex project and the environmental documents that were drafted uh, in regards to that project. Uh, the particulars will be available once uh, the action's formally commenced um, and it'll be disclosed to any person upon inquiry. All right, thank you. Uh, would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Curry, followed by the invocation by <laughs> Council Member Piotr, please. D just briefly, all Council Members voted for it. I have to disclose who voted for it, so everyone did. Okay. Please join me in the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You bow your heads to me. God, thank you so much for blessing us with this city and blessing our city. God, we ask that you would help us as a council to be wise, to use your wisdom, to make decisions that benefit the city. In Christ's name, amen. Madam Clerk. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. 
The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for City Council announcements. Uh, Mr. Petros. And tonight, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Curry. No. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Selich. No announcements. Mr. Piotr. I have an announcement. <coughs> I'm happy to announce that we attended the subcommittee for AQMD and we will have the AQMD hear our request to modify Rule 444 to exempt beach fires from their uh, open, open burn rule. So sometime next year we'll hear about it and we still have to deal with the commissioners, but that was successfully uh, scheduled for an agenda for this year on a 3-2 vote. And thank you, Mr. Kiff, for all your work on that. Uh, Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a quick announcement. If you're a boater in Newport Harbor <clears throat> and you're interested in the Water Board's proposed copper boat paint regulations, then please attend the Water Board's workshop on Friday, October 28th, 9 a.m. at the Irvine Ranch Water District. That's at 15, uh, <laughs> it's at Sand Canyon Avenue. You just have to look it up, Irvine. Irvine Ranch Water District. Um, <laughs> The city uh, and, and myself and anyone who's a boater is very, very concerned about these proposed regulations. They're going to cause a, an, a, a, a much higher cost of maintenance uh, on your boat and it's extremely, uh, gonna be extremely much higher, uh, like triple the cost to say, for example, bottom paint your boat and in some cases even higher. So. We'd like you to show up and if you and show your concern, and uh, and more information is available with at Newport Beach, uh, ca. gov slash copper tmdl. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Just wanted to give a quick congratulations to uh, Deputy Chief of Police Dave McGill, who's taken a head position as Chief of Police of Sedona, Arizona, one of the most beautiful uh, places in Arizona, in my opinion. And I think that everyone who drives through there should try to get out of a traffic ticket if you get stuck. <laughs> but in all sincerity, to give their congratulations to a city that's getting a real asset that's been a, a, a great, uh, he's been a long time Newporter and his, his wife's a lovely person. Thank oh, that's you. very nice, I concur with that. And I have a few announcements, uh, but first I'd like to turn it over to uh, City Manager Kiff who will give us, and listen carefully, we have a few changes to our meeting schedule over the next month or so. So, Mr. Kiff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Let me pull this up. I don't know. Ready, thanks. So um, council members and members of the audience and folks at home, uh, the council is about to wrap up its term here, which is a basically a two-year term, um, and we have, we have four, sorry, three scheduled meetings left after tonight. And I wanted to talk to you about those meetings because for the first time in Newport Beach's history, we would have a meeting scheduled on the uh, presidential general election night. And I've heard from a number of, of folks who've said um, that's not a good night, especially to have a big item um, because we usually tip, we use this room and we use the room behind us, the community room for overflow. The community room is used as a polling location. So um, it's my recommendation, and I, I will go ahead and uh, notice th these meetings, that the November 8th meeting be canceled, but the, the, ca the council hold a special meeting on Monday, November 7th, starting at 6 p.m. And what that will be interesting to folks who are following, especially the Auto Nation Porsche project. It's my uh, recommendation that we'll, we'll schedule the public hearing on that appeal of the Planning Commission's denial, again, for AutoNation Porsche, for that Monday uh, the 7th. We do have other business to accomplish that night, so there'll be a few other things on the item but the main, on that agenda, but uh, the main item will be AutoNation Porsche. So, again, no meeting on the 8th. Uh, then we move to the 22nd, and a number of council members will not be here. I still hope to have a quorum, but I'm asking our staff 
to make that a light meeting. We might have a couple of second readings on an item or two, but basically um, continue to hold that meeting but not have controversial things on there, in part because a number of our own residents will not be in town. Then we jump to the 29th. Uh, it's my recommendation that we hold a special meeting on the 29th. This would be for the sole purpose of hearing the museum house project. So that would be the one item on the agenda on the 29th. Now, if that passes, um, that would move to the regular meeting, uh, our one meeting in December, which is the 13th. And my proposal is that that start at five o'clock to uh, potentially hear a second reading of the museum house and any second reading of any item that may that this council may have been work have worked on during this term. One of those is the LCPIP, which uh, maybe achieve second reading before that date, but in case we need that, that's my recommendation. So if, unless the council members have any questions, um, th that's what I'd like to advertise to the public so the public can get some expectation of what's to come. Will we have any study sessions on any of those meetings? Not so far. Okay. All right, thank you, Dave, I appreciate that. So I have a couple of uh, general interest announcements uh, at our central library, always a fun place to hang out. The Newport Beach Library Foundation's outstanding lecture series will feature Lindsay Adario discussing her book, It's What I Do, A Photographer's Life of Love and War, this Saturday, October 29th at 7 p.m. Tickets are $50 each. And she has uh, received the Pulitzer, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and her work has appeared as I understand in National Geographic and on uh, many major publications. So she's in high demand. The next lecture is the city in the Cities Beyond the Canvas series will be about Henry Matisse. And Professor Jacqueline Hahn will give a free lecture Wednesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m. So all this information can be found on newportbeachlibrary.org for more information. And also for those of you who are interested in representing the community on OCTA as a public member, the Orange County Transportation Authority Board of Directors is seeking qualified applicants for a public member seat on the OCTA board. And so you may visit it's up here, www.octa.net slash public member. For more information and applications are being accepted through Monday, November 14th. And I also uh, want to report that last weekend I had a great ex personal experience. I had the pleasure to participate in uh, on an inspection trip of the State Water Project. I know some of my colleagues have done this. I've wanted to do this now for a couple of years and finally found uh, an available weekend and went up, flew up to Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta region in Northern California, saw where it all begins, uh, at the Feather River and the Oroville Dam, and really uh, have a uh, deep appreciation for what our Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and Metropolitan Water District of Orange County does to ensure that we have water, uh, good quality and uh, plenty of water coming down here to Southern California uh, there are improvements, so it's about an 80-year-old water management system, and um, they're constantly looking for ways to improve, so we do have our water. I'm pleased to report the fish are protected, the salmon are spawning, and the water is flowing, most particularly because we had some good rainfall in the last few months, including yesterday, and we have good water management here in Orange County, so I'm pleased to report that. All right, that's it. Uh, Madam Clerk public comments on consent calendar. This is a time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items one through 11. Public comments are invited on consent calendar for members of the audience. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have receive detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right, Mr. Petros. Mr. Curry. Aye. Mr. Selich. No items. Mr. Piotr. None. Mr. Duffield. None. And Mayor Pro Tem. All right, and I have a few items I'm pulling just to uh, elucidate more discussion. Item number four, item number six, 
I have a conflict on item number 10, and I'll pull item number 11. So four, six, and 11. So, oh, may we have a motion, please? Yes, move the balance of consent item uh, calendar, items one through 11, with recusal on item 10 from council members Dixon and Duffield, and items four, six, and 11, pulled by Mayor Dixon. May we have a second? Second. All right. Uh, let's go out to the public to, for public comments on the consent calendar, except for items four, six, and 11. Please come forward. Mm. Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, <clears throat> my name is Jim Mosier. I do have a comment on the consent calendar. Before that, I did want to comment on the, the city manager's change of meeting dates, which kind of seems to be a consent calendar item, although it's not on our agenda. Oh, what I wanted to say about that is, is the idea that city councils have their meetings on regular predictable dates is one of the most fundamental and oldest uh, features of the Brown Act. It survives in government code section 54954 and the public expects the meetings to be held on those dates and the procedure when a meeting cannot be held on one of those dates, which is in section 54955, which is equally old, if a quorum does not appear, the meeting can be moved to a later date. There's no provision for moving it to an earlier date. And I also note that the uh, city manager's memo says that in moving the date from Tuesday, November 8th to Monday, November 7th, will involve the council waiving policy A6. I'm not sure if you're waiving that tonight or how you could have done that without a vote. On the consent calendar item number three, this is an authorization of the city manager and the police chief to execute emergency management and homeland security grant applications. You're being asked to approve a resolution as I tried to point out <coughs> in writing, the resolution you're being asked to approve has at least two errors in it. Section one on page three dash four, it's saying that it's giving the Cal California Office of Emergency Services written authorization, it's actually given them written assurance. And number two, the assurance it's given in this as written says that the funds received from the grants will not be used to supplement the city's normal expenditures. Uh, the assurance they're asking for, it's not gonna be sup supplant, not supplement. The two words have opposite meanings and I have not heard in your action on the consent calendar whether you're planning to correct the resolution or not. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we will correct. I appreciate that. Those typographical mis um, mistakes can be corrected. Any other public comments on the remaining items on the consent calendar? Please come forward. Seeing none, so let's vote on the consent calendar. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, let's move to item number four, is a um, resolution in opposition to Proposition 57 on the November 8th general election ballot. Uh, I asked to pull this item uh, along with Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon, so to bring this matter to the people's attention, I believe there's much confusion about this measure on the ballot, and I uh, would like to help uh, communicate its provisions. I've asked uh, Police Chief John Lewis to come forward to clarify the reasons for the proposed resolution to oppose Proposition 57 because I uh, believe that this resolution is necessary for the safety of our community. I do wanna emphasize also that this is a bipartisan measure in the sense of our, our opposition and other opposition, it's bipartisan. Uh, nearly all district attorneys, prosecutors, judges, in California are opposed to this matter, uh, or this proposition, in addition to several victims' rights organizations. A number of city councils have passed resolutions in opposition to this matter, measure, as has the League of California Cities and members of the State Assembly and State Senate. Uh, one of the reasons that I've asked Chief Lewis to speak on it is that as I've learned about this measure, uh, I have learned that the measure's opponents have noted that the felonies to be included on the list of nonviolent felonies include some crimes most people would consider violent, such as rape of an unconscious or intoxicated person, 
in some cases of domestic violence or assault with a deadly weapon. So I hope Mr. Lewis can clarify for all of this. And additionally, I wish to note that notwithstanding in the staff report references to certain partisan organizations, uh, I bringing that we're bringing this forward because it is in our minds a nonpartisan matter. So it's uh, relevant. It's just want to educate the community on the provisions of this proposed measure. Mr. Chief Lewis, there you are. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Dixon, John Lewis, Chief of Police. And I thought I would start off our discussion here with just some nonpartisan background on this initiative. And I'm taking this information here from the Nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office, and I'm quoting from them. A yes vote on this measure means certain state prison inmates convicted of nonviolent non felony offenses would be considered for release earlier than otherwise. The state prison system could award additional sentencing credits for good behavior and approved rehabilitative or educational achievements. And what's important about that statement is the understanding, as you mentioned, of what a nonviolent offense is. And what I'm pointing out here is the nonviolent in this legislative definition may be different from what, or in contrast to what the public's idea of nonviolent is. And as you mentioned, this initiative allows for early parole consideration for individuals con convicted of rape, assault with a deadly weapon, and vehicular manslaughter, to name a few. Um, there's a number of um, specific offenses that are actually um, listed in the initiative themselves, and I encourage the public to, to look and, and decide for themselves if those criteria meet what their impression or uh, definition of a, of a nonviolent offense is. I think that's important to understanding this um, initiative. Also, while crime rates in Newport Beach are slightly down this year, we are at 1% coming into October 19th of this year. Many other communities in Orange County and across the state are experiencing spikes in, in crime. Passage of initiative like this with the potential to release more felons from prison really has the potential to uh, have impacts on, on public safety, not only in our communities, but, but statewide as well. So in conclusion to my remarks here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, I think it's important to also understand who is opposing this measure. And here in Orange County, the Orange County Chiefs of Police and Sheriff's Association are in opposition to this measure. The California Police Chiefs Association are also in opposition to this major, and also the California District Attorneys Association, along with crime victims and survivors uh, throughout the state. With that, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Chief. Any questions up here? Okay, why don't we go to the public? Any comments from members of the public? Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. <clears throat> First thing I want to point out is that the term partisan and nonpartisan refers not just to Republican and Democrat, it refers to, to issues on which there are two sides or more with strongly held beliefs on the two sides. Uh, the council is being asked here once again to waive its policy about placing items on the agenda so that you can take a position on this ballot measure, even though the last time I checked, the city council does not receive a ballot or vote. So the purposes we heard seems to be an attempt to influence voters. Uh, we've heard a lot about the people opposed to this measure. I assume there are also people who are in support of the measure. I have not studied it myself, but we've not heard that side of the issue. You apparently think it's important for this information in opposition to come out because you think it's a critical law and order matter. However well-meaning by uh, that might be, I would suggest that if you think it's appropriate to use government resources to tell us to vote how on ballot measures, it would be equally, equally appropriate to adopt a resolution telling us which of the several Newport Beach City Council candidates are the strongest on public safety and which of those candidates we should avoid. I think few people would find that an appropriate use of the public pulpit or the governmental resources at your disposal and I find item four no more appropriate. My understanding was that elections in America are supposed to be free elections, and the word free has many meanings, but one of those I thought was free of governmental influence. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Please come forward. Seeing none, we'll come back up here. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Is anybody, I don't see Thank any. you. I just want to thank the chief for his analysis. Uh, this is, first off, it falls within a legitimate city of business. It's being done up and down the state. 
and it's uh, this this case of League of Women of Vote League of Women Voters versus Countrywide Criminal Justice Coordination Commission has ruled that these sort of positions for the city are allowable. And one reason they are is because we are looking out for the best interests of our city, and this actually will cost our city money. These are the crimes that were going to be reduced from non from violent to quote nonviolent. Rape of an unconscious person, assault with a deadly weapon, taking a hostage, domestic violence involving trauma, lewd acts upon a child, failing to register as a sex offender, arson causing great bodily injury, discharging a firearm on school grounds, false imprisonment of an elder. So, our residents do care about, the, about being educated about this issue because it's gonna affect uh, our police resources and our budget. And it's gonna affect their children and their own safety and well-being. Um, the other point that I wanted to make about uh, the importance of this uh, is that when you, when you read the statement, in my opinion, it's very misleading. And that's why I thought it was so important to educate the voters on what is really happening. There is a very attractive aspect to it that says that a judge is allowed to determine what charges a minor can face versus the prosecutor. But as the system stands already, the judge has a lot of leeway as to how the minor can be uh, prosecuted, whether it's adult or as a minor, for a very egregious crime. Sometimes minors are charged as adults. And the judge also has a lot to say over um, the punishment, if any. So uh, essentially, this really is not solving that problem as much as is looking to solve uh, an issue of, of, of prison capacity, and the state is facing a budget pro crisis, and they're having a tough time paying for these prisoners to be held, although they've committed serious violent uh, criminal, or felons, and um, felonies, excuse me, and uh, I believe it's in the best interest of the residents of Newport Beach to educate themselves about 57. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, we call for the vote. We need a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion to... I'll move we approve it. We have a second. second. All right, let's call for the vote. Motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, the next item I pulled also I uh, just is item number six, the encroachment agreement for existing improvements within the public right of way in the Newport Center area. I think this is uh, I support the concept. I just wonder if we should go more broadly or establish different policy for all certain, establish a principle for how we want to create these encroachments instead of making a waiver for one area of Newport Center. Do you want to comment, Mr. Webb? Yeah, actually, thank you, Mayor, Madam Mayor. Um, this is really a cleanup legislation. A lot of these encroachments were put back in the late 60s when they built Newport Center. And when we did a parcel map on the Irvine Company's property on the 500 block, one of the conditions of approval was to take care of some of the encroachments. When we looked at it and we went back with the Irvine Company staff, we all realized there was no agreement for any of the encroachments. When the center was built, as you know, there are a lot of bollards and specialty pavement planners put in. They actually have uh, pedestrian easements that take you out of the right-of-way, walk you through their property and back. So it's a little anomaly. We wanted to clean it up with this action. We don't have too many of these that would probably warrant a, a policy change unless you feel different than that, but, but it's kind of a case-by-case. Case. Once in a while, we'll bring things to you. It's, it's usually more residential encroachments. We see more of this, but not right. so much commercial. So All right. I, I don't see any particular reason unless you'd like to explore. No, further. I just want a clarification on staff's recommendation. All right. Any comments up here? I'll go to the public. Any comments from the public on item number six? Please come forward. Seeing none, let's bring it back here. Do we have a motion? A second? Let's vote. Motion carries unanimously, 7-0. Okay, and item number 11. A uh, summary review of the first eight months of operation of the city's visitors serving Marina at Marina Park. I see Mr. Webb again. Actually, uh, thank you very much. I want to introduce Shannon Levin. Most of you know her. She's kind of the, the, the uh, heavy lifter at Marina Park in charge with getting the uh, marina up and operating along with the software. And I asked her to come down tonight and talk about this item for you. Right, and thank you, Shannon. My question is really related. First of all, you're doing a great job. I'm pleased to see that our visiting boats uh, and yachts enjoying uh, the wonderful docking amenities that we have. 
in reading the staff report, uh, I, I know it's always, something new is always slow to take off. I, I really wanted to focus tonight on just understanding more in your marketing and how we are reaching out, as you already indicated, to yacht clubs and other boating enthusiasts. And then also, are we doing surveys on those who are already been experiencing our amenities and what have we learned in the first eight months and what can we expect going forward? Okay, well, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Dixon and council members. Um, I'm Shannon Levin with the Harbor Resources Division. Um, Marina Park has been very successful lately and what we've learned is that you know, we've got the recipe right for all of our customer service. We're really hitting the nail on the head and we've done a lot of local advertisement and marketing with the log newspaper and some of those other publications. And as you mentioned, moving forward, we need to hit a broader stroke and that's hitting the bigger boating magazines like Sea Magazine and putting um, ourselves in contact with a lot of the yacht clubs up and down the coast as far north as Vancouver, British Columbia and trying to get a hold of those cruising clubs as they're cruising out to Mexico or if it's cold up north, they're gonna come down to us. And that is something that is on the forefront right now in our off season. We're also um, working to um, get in touch with some of the special events, like especially the Christmas boat parade or the Newport to Ensenada and some of these significant um, boat events that are up and down the coast, um, the Baja Ha Ha, making sure that we're part of their stop along the coast. and so. Um, we just recently put an advertisement in Latitude 38, which is a huge boating magazine, a big publication. So we're advertising, and then we're also trying to get some articles written about Marina Park so that those aren't just um, kind of a canned advertisement that you see in each of the papers, that there's actually gonna be an interest um, in, in, our, in our facility. And that's, that's on the forefront right now. Have you done surveys of uh, user, current users, past users? We don't have any technical surveys. It's it's pretty much just word of mouth. You know, what did you like about it? And most people just have really, really amazing things to say about the facility and their experience. Um, when we do have any feedback, we take it seriously. You know, th they might just have a small comment about um, access or, you know, their neighbors. You know, that evening. But um, other than that, it's just been really amazing and one of the things that I've heard um, some people will say this place is wonderful we don't want to tell anybody about it you know it's like no 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 you have to go and tell your friends and yes, so we want them to know right so th people are really enjoying the experience and it's just hitting hitting a different market and it and reservations are available online so we we do accept reservations online and we accept reservations by phone email online and that's up to six months in advance so we've got um, bookings already through um, February even. So yeah, we're doing pretty well. Very good, well I'm mm -hmm. anxious to see the revenues continue to, to rise. Um, any questions from anyone up here? Seeing none, any member of the public would like to speak on Marina Park? Seeing none, we'll come back. Uh, may we have a motion to support? Oh, it's just receive and file actually, excuse me. No motion. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Um, <coughs> so I guess we are now go to Madam Clerk. Public comments on non-agenda items. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Members of the public who would like to speak, please come forward. Hi, I'm Mike Glenn, resident of Balboa Island, uh, also a current bidder on the uh, Balboa Theater. My bid was $1.6 million. Chris Caluso also bid $1.7 million. Last council meeting, you agreed to vote it for one mil you agreed to sell it for $1 million, anywhere from 160 to 170 percent more money could have been made with either one of our offers, and I know there were others on the table as well, which the amounts I do not know. I would ask the council to reconsider this particular vote from last session. Thank you. Any other comments? Please come forward. Um, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Moser. Uh, I, I would give Newport Beach an E for effort in trying to achieve transparent, open government, but much less than an A for accomplishment. As a city, we have an excellent searchable archive of public documents and I think our staff is to be commended for that. 
but we do very poorly on such things as televising public meetings, coming nowhere close to such other cities as little San Juan Capistrano that manages to provide on-demand video for absolutely every public meeting they hold. We also now seem to be having a problem regarding having predictable future meeting dates. But what really bothers me is that an increasing amount of the interaction between the council members and between the council members and the city staff appears to be occurring outside of public meetings and outside of public scrutiny at all. Uh, this is a committee, city committee roster from two years ago, and it mentions in it a council building ad hoc committee and a council ad hoc committee to negotiate the reuse of the city hall site. Before that roster, there were rosters that indicated ad hoc council committees to negotiate a wide range of development agreements. I have reason to question the propriety of most of those committees, but at least the public knew who had been appointed to them, and there were resolutions specifying what those appointed were being appointed to do. But two planning commission meetings back, the commission was asked out of the blue to make a recommendation about an agreement locking in rights to one million square feet of new resort development, and I don't know how many new homes in Newport Coast in the annexation area, and the commission was told the details of the agreement had been negotiated and final details were being refined by a council committee. I would like to know who appointed that committee and how they were authorized to act on behalf of the city. Similarly, at the Board of Library Trustees meeting last week, the trustees heard a presentation from a public works employee about the current status of the new Corona Del Mar Library. As I remember it, the board felt a little left out of the process and asked if they could review the so-called value engineering changes that had been made since they last saw the plans. The public works employee told the trustees he would have to get permission to do that from the council committee overseeing the project. Again, who, commit, who appointed that committee? Why are they not on our roster? And even if they were, how could they have been authorized to direct city staff when our charter prohibits council members from doing that except through instruction to the city manager? This bothers me, and I suspect it's just the tip of the iceberg of non-transparency in Newport Beach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. City Attorney or Mr. City Manager, do you want to comment? I'm not aware of these committees, so maybe somebody. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, it's fairly typical that we would uh, meet with one or two council members if a project is within their district and they've expressed an interest in that. We're careful not to talk with a majority of you about that. Um, so it, it's not necessarily something that's appointed by anyone. This is the typical feedback that we'd ask for from you if something is happening in your district. So that's fairly typical of what we do. I just uh, push back a little bit gently, Mr. Mosier, about scheduling meetings. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of damned if I do and damned if I don't. I got a no number of people who said, don't meet on election night, and I totally respect that. So I'm trying to be respectful of that. They're not council members, by the way. They're members of the public that said, I'd like to be at a hearing, and I don't want to have to conflict with election night. So, you know, gently, uh, again, I, I feel like I can't win on this one. I'd like to try to, I'm trying to be as responsive as I can to the needs of the public. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Uh, yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is George Schroeder, and I've been a resident of Newport Beach since 1987-88. And um, I know I'm not the oldest person in the room. I'm getting up there, but I'm not that old. But I do remember when our city council meetings used to be on Monday nights. There was a conflict with Monday night football. Got moved to Tuesdays, but I do remember in the 80s and 90s even, I think we met on Monday nights. And that's what I got accustomed to. So, uh, and also, I, I just want to speak for all the residents at home watching, and for myself, I want to thank city staff, city manager, and the council for changing it, because I was dreading having to choose to come here on a Tuesday night. I do like to attend and participate if I feel there is a strong enough issue. We have a lot of things on the agenda, so to have this on Tuesday night, election night, would be ridiculous, and probably the only mistake is we, we didn't change it, you know, a couple of months back when we saw the conflict. And also, I've served on boards and com 
missions, and there's always a thing where you waive the bylaws to make an important change. So if it's policy A6 or whatever it is, by all means do that, and let's change it so we can have a council meeting that people can watch and attend so we can do important business. Also, I want to say that the city staff and the planning commission has been working on important projects that have just gone through the planning commission with this city council some of this city council has been on the council for 10 and 11 years, okay? And I think it's a responsible thing to do if you can wrap those things up with this council to, to do that. So again, thank you for, you know, rearranging the city council's schedule because to flop those projects onto a new city council without any experience with that or without, you know, the expertise that this council has and not to say anything about the new candidates, but we do have kind of a deep bench here that we're gonna be losing. So kudos to Mr. Selich and Mr. Curry and Mr. Petro. So if you can participate on these projects, fantastic. So I, I just wanna thank uh, city staff and city manager, and I'm sure there are quite a few residents at home who appreciate what's been done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Beth Mays and I am the Student Services Coordinator for Anaheim University. It may surprise you to know that Anaheim has a nationally accredited online university and we are currently celebrating our 20 year anniversary. We've been known globally as a pioneer in online education since 1996, yet very few of our neighbors even realize that we exist. We're here to introduce ourselves and to inform you of a scholarship that we are offering our president, Dr. Andrew Honeycutt, has approved a 40% tuition discount on our online MBA and Masters of Entrepreneurship programs for Orange County residents and workers who enroll by the end of March of next year. We invite you to visit us at our admissions office on State College Boulevard or at our center at Tustin and La Palma to learn more about our history and the advantages of online learning. Our student services staff can answer any questions you may have about our programs. And of course, you can visit our website at anaheim.edu. We hope to see Newport Beach residents become more involved with our university, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Bracey. I'm also from Anaheim University, and I'd just like to follow up quickly on what uh, my colleague Beth Mays just said. We believe people should be able to advance their credentials and their careers without having to go into debt. That is why we are offering a 40% discount to those who work or live in Orange County that will be in effect until March 31st, 2017. It's a special scholarship that we hope many residents of Newport Beach will be able to take advantage of. Our MBA programs are 18 months in length and with our special uh, pay-as-you-learn payment system, students are able to graduate debt-free without having to take out private loans or be tied down by government loans. Anaheim University is known for having the first fully online graduate programs on the West Coast. We now have students around the world in 40 different countries with many graduates at multinational Fortune 500 companies and with our ongoing relationship with the National Basketball Associations, Retired Players Association. We even have several former professional athletes in the MBA programs. We hope by making education affordable, we can help to give back to our neighbors here in Newport Beach by improving the business skills of the workforce. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next comment, please. Good evening, council members. My name is Chuck Grew. I came uh, here to uh, address Councilman Duffield. Uh, you may recall that I was here in May to speak about uh, Museum House. It has now been approved by the Planning Commission and will likely be before you shortly. Again, I remind you that I voted for you. The reason that I voted for you and the reason all others did was that not only do you have a successful local business, but more important, you are a longtime resident. This means that you know the value of the character of the city. You, knew, you know that the vast majority of our residents don't want to be in LA by the bay, and we don't want high rises. When I voted for you, I was sure that a number that as a member of this city council, that you would work to protect our community against developers who would like to transform us into something that we don't want to be. As projects such as Museum House are brought before you, 
I know that you, with such deep roots in the community, will lead the fight against them and protect the Newport for that all of us love. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public would like to make a comment on a non-agenda item? Seeing none, all right. Uh, oral reports from City Council on committee activities. We'll start over on the other side, Mr. Piotr. Mr. Duffield. Thank you, Madam Mayor, I have a quick one. I was uh, at the Newport Bay Watershed Executive Committee um, on October 19th, last Wednesday. Um, our committee consists of County Supervisor Michelle Steele, representatives from upstream cities, including Tustin, Costa Mesa, Irvine, Santa Ana, and Lake Forest. Other members also include the Irvine Company, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board. We received an updated copy of the 2016 Executive Action Plan for the Central Orange County Watershed Management Area. In it are items that directly affect our harbor. And I am encouraged that this document and the members of the Newport Bay Management Committee, they do all the hard work, which includes some of our city staff, will move on these items that need a addressing with an aggressive timeline and plan for funding. I will be reporting back on how this watershed action plan is progressing and it has huge implications on dredging in the future, trash and water quality in our harbor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, please come to our water quality committee meeting. You can report on that too. The next one. Okay, <laughs> yeah, seriously, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. The last council meeting, I was not feeling well, and I enjoyed watching council from the comfort of my couch on MBTV. But uh, I would like to join in what Councilman Curry said, that we had a, uh, we both attended the League of Cities event in Long Beach, and uh, I attended some of the legal courses that were relevant to uh, city actions, and very interesting and informative. Thank you. Mr. Selich. No items for reports. Mr. Curry. Mr. Petro. Um, <clears throat> yes, as you might recall at the last city council meeting, I begged and I pleaded uh, with my fellow Newport Beach residents to attend the uh, October 13th Finance Committee because that was going to be the meeting that we actually had a uh, the first primer on our unfunded liability, def setting a definition and a foundation for just what this huge uh, issue is before the city. This is probably, no, not probably, this is the fundamental defining issue for the city of Newport Beach and for every community in Orange County and throughout the state of California. So I ask that you come and join us to learn about this, to find out what it would do to you, to your pocketbook, your comfort of your own home. And I'd like to thank all of the residents of Newport Beach for their confidence. I'm honored and humbled by the confidence you have in me, Mr. Curry, Madam Mayor, and those other members of the Finance Committee, because not one member of the public, other than Mr. Mosier, thank you, Mr. Mosier, attended. People, this is a key, fundamental, foundational issue that will affect the budget and the future of Newport Beach. Please get involved. We will be hosting another Finance Committee that will be even longer on November 14th, with again the sole purpose being the unfunded liability. Determining what that is, what it means, how to address it, what are some strategies that we can do. This is your purse, people. Please join us. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Please come forward for public comment. Is there someone? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Um, um, Mayor. Uh, good evening, um, Mayor and uh, City Council members, city staff, uh, community members here and at home. My name is Tanya from the Association of U.S. Army, and with me is Mike Whitaker. We uh, would like to invite you to join our second annual Veterans Honor Ride as we um, honor our veterans for all services um, to the nation. 
and it is scheduled on Sunday, November 6th um, at the Huntington Beach Pier Plaza, um, the entrance to uh, PCS and 6th Street. Um, the registration is open from 7.30 to 9.30, and um, the opening ceremony starts at 9.30, kicks stand up at 10 o'clock. Um, everyone with or without a motorcycle are uh, welcome to attend. For uh, bikers, we uh, would like to ask that they must have a uh, motorcycle license, wear helmet, want to honor veterans, and obey uh, traffic laws. Um, this is a fundraising to support all proceeds going to support the Veterans Service Center located at the um, Los Alamitos base. And this is all volunteer effort. Um, online registrations is available online at veteransonarai.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move into public hearing. Uh, the number, item number 12, it's the annual review of zoning implementation and public benefit agreement for the sober living by the sea. So, Ms. Yes. Brandt. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening. This is the seventh annual um, review of the development agreement between the city of Newport Beach and sober living by the sea. We have provided you with a detailed staff report. It's staff's recommendation that the city council does find sober living by the sea in conformance and in compliance with the terms of the development agreement. We do have a brief presentation to present to the council if you are interested. And there is a representative from sober living by the sea as well here to answer any questions. Yes, would you please proceed? Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Dixon, members of the City Council, Melinda Whalen, Planning Division. And like Ms. Brandt uh, said, this, this is the seventh annual review of the Zoning Implementation and Public Benefit Agreement. And um, as part of this review, compliance re reports are submitted um, twice a year from Sober Living by the Sea um, to provide the current facility locations and the number of beds. And currently there are 44 client beds citywide at eight locations um, where the zoning agreement allows two, 204 beds. And this map uh, shows in green the open facilities at the eight different addresses and all of the closed facilities in blue. Also part of um, the review, uh, code enforcement does inspections uh, twice a year and they look for the location, the number of beds, um, off-street parking requirements, and overall cleanliness of the facilities, and interior inspections and exterior inspections in June and September. Um, all facilities were found to be in compliance. And a review for calls for service during this period. Um, PD, all were uh, minor in nature, and um, there was one parking citation and one parking complaint um, where a verbal warning was given and action plan protocol was followed for 4711 seizure and no further complaints. Um, the administrative operations were also, are also reviewed. Um, they were all found in compliance with the zoning agreement. The offices are located at 2800 Lafayette with um, parking spaces provided at 2805 Villa Way. And um, the number of attendees at the client meetings um, were logged, which is provided in attachment A of the staff report. All uh, were found in compliance with the operational conditions. So staff uh, recommends that the council um, receive and file the documents submitted by Sober Living by the Sea and um, finds that Sober Living by the Sea has demonstrated good faith for compliance with the terms of the zoning agreement. And I'm available for questions, thank, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, do we have any public comments? Please come forward. Seeing none, uh, let's go to the vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, I am going to recuse myself as I believe Council Member Duffield is as well. My husband is a member of the Newport Harbor Yacht Club and Mr. 
Duffield. And uh, Mr. Duffield is too, so we will excuse ourselves for a moment. And Mayor Pro Tem Muldoon will do what he has to do. I am on, I'm sorry. Uh, All right, staff. <laughs> Mayor Potem and members of the City Council, this item is uh, really a cleanup item for the Newport Harbor Yacht Club. Um, just a little background, in 2014, the city approved uh, a, a series of entitlement applications for the reconstruction of the Newport Harbor Yacht Club. Um, they were contingent upon a coastal land use plan amendment that was later submitted and then deemed unnecessary and withdrawn. And so all the entitlements for the Yacht Club are contingent upon that action. And with that action not occurring, um, obviously we want to make sure those entitlements are effective. So the ordinance before you tonight simply makes several small changes to the previous resolutions and ordinance to make that uh, entitlement process effective. And so we can proceed forward with the uh, permitting of the reconstruction of the Yacht Club, which is expected to occur um, fairly shortly. So if there's any other questions, happy to answer it. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Council? I'll move the item. Second. For public comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor Pertem Muldoon my, and members of the council. My, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, I read the staff report. I think I understand the action that's involved here, but I am a little confused about it. Uh, the, the city apparently amended the general plan to change some of the property uses around the Yacht Club from, from residential to private institution. And as near as I can make out, there was a plan to make a, a comparable change to the Coastal Land Use Plan. As we just heard, that was withdrawn because apparently from the Coastal Commission point of view, that was not necessary to go forward with the Coastal Development Permit or the Yacht Club rebuilding on the Yacht Club property. However, if we changed the general plan, I'm not understanding why we didn't go ahead with the, anyway, with the comparable change to the coastal land use plan, because it seems now we, if I'm understanding this, we now have an inconsistency between the two. One of them is showing the properties changed to private institution, the other one is showing them still residential. So uh, I would like to understand why we didn't continue with the coastal land use plan change and if there's any problem with the two being inconsistent as they now appear to be. Thank you. Before we ask for clarification, any other public speakers on this item? All right, seeing none, Mr. Campbell. Uh, certainly, the, the general plan and the coastal land use plan um, involved really an increase in the intensity of the development as well as to change the uh, land use of certain residential parcels that are under the, the, uh, under the parking lot. Um, now, the coastal land use plan is not inconsistent in that it does allow for the intensity of development that the general plan amendment authorized, and so there really wasn't a need to increase or change that intensity. So it was really kind of a cleanup item between the, uh, uh, the items. And so um, while we'll have a minor inconsistency with some land use designations of some, some lots under the parking lot, it really doesn't change the intensity or affect the ability to do the project. And so uh, we felt it was important just to move forward and, and take that off the Commission's agenda and allow it to go forward with the Coastal Development Permit. So, Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Petros, do you have a motion? Second. All right, call the vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2016-16, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, modifying the effective dates of City Council policy, uh, resolution number 2014-19, resolution number 2014-20, and ordinance number 2014-6, regarding a placement cl replacement clubhouse for the Newport Harbor Yacht Club located at 720 West Bay Avenue. Okay, start the motion. Oh, yeah. The motion carries unanimously, 5-0. For the record, I would like it noted as a diehard Cleveland fan, I was mayor for a moment while the Cleveland Indians were in the uh, World Series. <laughs> Did they win? So noted. Oh. 
<laughs> Your moment of glory. All right, thank you. All right, item number 14 is Seminex SLU Maintenance Project Award of Construction Contract. Mr. Webb. Yes, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This is an item we're bringing back. As you recall, about two meetings ago, we had a bid and we rejected bids and had to reformat it. And we've come back with bids uh, for favorable recommendation to you tonight. Mark Vukojevich, our Deputy Director and City Engineers, to give, here to give you a small staff report. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, very briefly, um, as you may know, the Seminex Slough used to be part of the former alignment for the Santa Ana River as it came through Newport Beach. Um, now it is part of a larger estuary and drainage uh, system there too. Several years ago, or actually just a few years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged kind of the, the northern and western half of the slough and created a, a further estuary uh, above that. And what we're proposing to, to do tonight is to dredge and maintain the southern or the eastern half, again shown here in red. It's approximately uh, 7,000 cubic yards that we would remove um, by dewatering that area. Um, and in addition, we would also clean out the area that's owned by uh, Caltrans, where a very large storm drain box uh, outlets into the slough. And here's a view from the Newport Shores uh, neighborhood. Uh, project uh, would start here um, in probably early December, continue for about uh, three months. Uh, we have all of our permits. Um, as best I can tell, this project has been talked about for many, many years. And we're finally uh, got all of our permits in place and we're excited to get moving on it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Petros. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mark, your, your comments well taken. Uh, I remember uh, as I started my tenure on the council uh, and would visit with my friends in the shores, which I will still say put on the best party. Those folks know how to have a barbecue. <laughs> um, this matter came up and I believe I have attended uh, a handful of meetings with the folks in the shores. I have attended meetings with uh, uh, other representatives uh, related to this. It's been four years that I've been trying to work this out. We have been stymied by potential toxins in the soil. We've been stymied by the question of easements along the banks. We've had to address ownership matters. This, this simple project of just removing sediment from a waterway uh, seems to have just every possible roadblock that has been thrown in front of it. So it is my great pleasure that I move <laughs> the award of construction contract for the Seminex Slough maintenance project. I'll second. All right. Any comments from the members of the public? Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Dixon and members of the council, I, I seem to recall from the previous meeting, it was confirmed that the western side of this, for some obscure reason, is still privately owned, but the city was in some kind of negotiation for that, and I'm curious if any change has happened in the status of what's shown in purple on this map, page 14-5 of the staff report, or the taxpayers will still be paying to dredge something or improve something that is still technically privately owned. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Webb, do you want to address that point? Actually, yes, ma'am. Um, as you recall, we had a discussion with the private property owner who bought the a portion of the slough to the east side uh, on a tax sale. It is privately owned. We've tried to uh, negotiate with him to get the property. Uh, we reached out and offered council's uh, fair market value price that you gave it to, and he still is not able to uh, come to terms with that. He thinks the property is worth a lot more. So at this point, we're recommending to go forward without it. We can work on our property. We own the uh, eastern half of the slough, and we'll go ahead and do all the removals there. Does that compromise the work that we would want to do? Um, it won't compromise his property, and I think we'll be able to get out enough material that it'll make uh, what we want to do accomplish the effort there. All right, very good. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll come back to the council. Any comments? Seeing, did you have a comment, Mr. Piatta? No? Vote. All right, let's vote. <laughs> the motion carries unanimously, 7-0. 
All right, our last item, number 15, police headquarters and fire station number three, roofing project. Mr. Webb. Yes, this is a carry on from the last item. If you recall, we had some discussion on this and we wanted to get some further detail from uh, for various folks, for uh, Councilman Priyad and others. So our staff, uh, Mark Vukovich went through and he'll give you a little update on that. We've got that material and we're coming back tonight to recommend approval of the project and start the roofing project. Okay, uh, thank you, Dave. Again, uh, very briefly, I'll just kind of go over. I prepared a, a quick little overview of, of roofing systems, in particular for flat roofing systems, because um, this is what we're dealing with on the police station and on the fire station, too. There's basically three different types, and within each different type, there's a different variation and, and method. Some are more popular than others. Um, you know, a lot of folks uh, recognize and know of a tar and gravel roof. It's it's a very common roof, but the newer technology is more towards what's called a single ply membrane roof. Um, however, what we're proposing is what's called a modified bitumen uh, or uh, bitumen roof too, which is kind of a, a modern high strength uh, rubberized membrane. So roofing systems depend on a lot of different factors, uh, including location, what kind of lifespan you want out of them, the nature of the facility. Again, if the equipment below is as critical or if it's a warehouse, maybe it's, you know, if you get a leak, it's not as critical. Um, and basically what kind of equipment and penetrations you have on the roof too. Labor seems to be the overwhelming cost factor when it comes to these roofs because they need to be torn out and then replaced and then all of the facilities that are on there too. This is a prevailing wage construction uh, project as well too. And one of the things I noted in talking to some contractors what was, and I haven't been able to verify this factually, but in their estimation, the cost of labor for roofing projects over the last 20 years has increased by 400%. So that's maybe an antidote, maybe it's not correct, but uh, that was the information that I got from some contractors. But what we did separately over the last two weeks is we hired a third party um, specialty consultant which all they do is roofs. And we had them come out and take a look at our fire station roof and they agreed, first thing being that it needs to be replaced and, and they also agreed in writing that this is a very, very flat roof. Actually, they used very only once in their, in their letter. But, <laughs> um, and then they, get, they recommended, um, and I think they, they wrote something, if I were doing this roof, I would choose one of, one of two roofing systems, which was this modified bitumen with gravel or single ply roof. Um, and for, so back to our, our recommendation for the, the police station, you know, based on its size and how many penetrations and uh, what's proposed, it's, a, it's called what's called a torch down modified bitumen roof. Um, and it has specialty walkway pads and different things, um, all the Title 24 coatings and, and, and it comes with a 30 year um, labor material non-prorated warranty. So in other words, if something leaks over the next 30 years, they come and fix it. Uh, fire station's a little bit different. It's a different version of a modified bitumen roof, but it also has gravel on top. The gravel acts um, as another barrier, acts as a, as a weight. It acts as a uh, moisture dissipator as well too. Um, but this cost is a little more expensive, but as we really dive down into it, you know, we found out, you know, you look at all the different walls, uh, vertical walls, base flashings that you have to roof that increases the square footage. We have an extremely flat part of the roof where we had to actually build what's called a cricket or a little mini drainage uh, canal. Um, and then that also comes with a 30 year warranty. I think I showed some of these pictures to you at the last council meeting. Uh, here's an overview of the police station uh, roof. Um, pretty easy, you know, we'll just work around a few things. <laughs> um, but it, it's very complicated, 33 air conditioning units and the heliport and things like that too. It, it's very, very, most of the cost is in labor. And then on the fire station, um, it's a simpler building. Um, the, the west side has more of the, uh, the units and things like that. You can kind of see where the ponding is on the east side where we're proposing to build um, the little cricket sub drainage system. Um, and again, some of the other photos. But. So it's labor intensive um, and it's, you know, mission critical facilities too. So the, um, and warranty we felt was, was very important and we have a good quality product. It's been used, uh, this company and their products uh, have been used in other cities like Huntington Beach and Fountain Valley. Um, and um, here are the prices here, but we, uh, we're, we're using this, the uh, special purchasing agreement through the U.S. Communities um, Government Purchasing Program. 
um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions up here? Mr. Keanu, did you have a question? Yes, please. Uh, Mark, you said we'd been looking at some different options. You said the options that the consultant recommended was the single membrane roof or the uh, gravel roof. Uh, and this afternoon you said you got some preliminary numbers that basically the contractor could do either one for the same price. Um, yes, what he said is he, he didn't have time to do an official cost estimate on that, but in his opinion that it would be um, close to the same price. But the big difference being that a single ply membrane roof would have a 20 year warranty as opposed to a 30 year warranty. And then the other difference being that you would have to add, um, it doesn't do as well for tra traffic areas, basically where you have equipment that you need to maintain, in this case, our air conditioning units on, on the west side of the building here for the fire station. So that was um, their recommendation. I mean, it's certainly an option, but, um, but it, it should be about the same price. It could be more, it could be a little bit less. But I think we make up for it in the in the in the warranty. So the, does the bitumen roof, the gravel roof, have the traffic pads in it for the equipment as well? Do you know? I don't think so. No, because the gravel can act as as that uh, where you can walk on top of. Yeah. yeah, you walk on top of the gravel and it kind of pushes through to the roof and pokes holes in it. Yes, that's what happens. <laughs> uh, I've worked with Mark. Mark's been really good on this thing. Uh, the, the single ply membrane roof is a more modern roof, even though they say that the warranty is the same. The experience has been that those roofs are lasting longer. Uh, my preference would be is to to go with that roof. Uh, and I guess the question would be is if we were to do that, do you want to come back to us with a number, or can we give you authorization to go with that roof, and only if it's higher you'd come back, if the council so decided. You know, um, okay, um, well, we could. Uh, yeah, if, if that's the council's desire, it'd probably be best to just go ahead and bring it back on a future agenda. Well, are you making a motion for that? So my proposal would be if you, if bringing it back the right way and we're not in an urgent situation, like you said before, to come back with a single ply roof for the fire station with traffic pads in a, in a final number that we can approve. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Is sorry. there a second? That's a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, Dave or Mark, may I just ask a question? Are we, do we, we have a live bid now? Are we going, is there, are they at risk if we delay further? No, because we're using the uh, government purchase program. I mean, the industry is definitely gonna be busier here sooner rather than later. Um, so are the, what, are, are the bids going to hold that you currently have? Yes. And then did you say that you had a third party concur in the recommendation that you're presenting? They said you could use either one and they would recommend either, either system. So I think you're basically down to a preference issue um, and also you know 20 year versus 30 year warranty. So I think for the same price, we can get a 30 year warranty roof. Uh, that would be our recommendation. Just one other thing to consider. The FFP calls for this building to be replaced in 2025. Now we would be recommending probably because particularly with the police station, some other improvements, we, when we talk to the finance committee this year, maybe pushing that another five or 10 years. But I don't think this building, unless council sees it otherwise, will be there in 20 years because the d direction was to try to uh, relocate these facilities. That's just something to consider if we're looking between a 20 and 30 year roof. Um, All right. Any. Oh, Mr. Curry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would offer a substitute motion to move the staff recommendation uh, as presented by staff. Uh, it's just utterly foolish here to try and re-engineer this building because some councilman thinks you ought to do it a different way after going through the, an extensive process here uh, to get this bid, to engineer the process, to come up with professional specifications, and then to have someone come up and say, I think you ought to do it this way, it's just foolish. So I would uh, offer a substitute motion to move the staff recommendation. All right, um, any comments from the public, please come forward. Seeing none, we'll come back here. We will vote on the substitute motion to accept the staff recommendation. I think we have discussion on that first. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it doesn't make any difference. You can flip a coin one way or the other. 
it it is a matter of preference. Gravel is not a roof that's used very wide, widely, and it's not just my opinion. The independent consultant said the same thing. So, you know, it's up to the council. Either way they want to go. I I think that getting rid of gravel and ends up with an easier, more maintainable roof. Uh, the warranties tend to not be worth the paper they're written on because the conditions of actually paying out on them are so severe that no one ever maintains their roof adequately to say that you know they're going to pay off in a warranty. So the warranty doesn't mean anything. Uh, on a gravel roof, you can ask people that maintain roofs. You know, a, a leak will come in one spot, and the actual penetration in the roof where it's leaking is you know 20 feet or 30 feet or 40 feet away. Uh, and it's very hard to find on a gravel roof where it's a lot easier in a single membrane roof. So it's just a matter of, of uh, preference. Um, and, I, and I do think from a maintenance standpoint, the, the industry is going away from gravel and they're going to the single membrane roof. So it's no skin off my nose. I just think it'll be better for the city if we go single. And I have put a million and a half square feet of roof on, so I've bought a couple of roofs before. Uh, and the roofing consultant that they use is a very widely um, accepted roofing consultant. Okay, Mr. Curry, did you? Okay, any other comments? Let's call for the vote on the substitute motion. Council Member Duffield and Piotr, thank you. Go ahead. The motion carries 5-2 with Council Members Piotr and Duffield voting no. Okay, Madam Clerk, I'm sorry. Madam motion Clerk. for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>